Dear ones, if you can't uh, hear in the back uh, row, would you raise your hand and then I'll know uh, during the, the talk. Uh, what I'd really like to do is tonight and next Sunday night uh, just share some teachings with you about the victorious life. Uh, because during October, we'll spend all of October really uh, listening to the reports from Amsterdam, France, Germany, London and Puerto Rico. And so we'll be seeing slides and hearing the testimonies of the brothers and sisters about the work that God was doing through them during the summer. So really, these will be just the two teachings that we'll have before the November. And I think maybe it's better not to have a question time during these two evenings, but to begin the question times during November. Uh, What I'd really like to share is the truth that you find in John chapter 8 and verse 32 if you would like to look at it. And it's page 931 in that black RSV, John 8 and verse 32. And it really is a freeing statement that God gives us here in this verse, John 8 and 32. And God says this through Jesus, And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, there's no reason at all for you at any time in your Christian life to be anything but totally free. Really. There is no reason for you to ever be anything but free. And the truth always will make you free. And it is only the deception of Satan and the lies of Satan that will ever bring you into bondage. And yet why I share this tonight is because a number of us at different stages in our Christian lives come into bondage. And we don't need to, brothers and sisters. It is true that the truth makes you free. And you know, if you look down a few verses at verse 36, you see really where the truth is and how it does make you free. In verse 36 it runs, So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And every time you deal with the truth that is in Jesus, you live free. And loved ones, every time you miss that truth, you come into bondage. Now, really, there are four great stages in our Christian life where you can come into bondage, you know. Just four great times. And they correspond, really, to four parts of Jesus' life. The first one is that whole element of conscience. And many of us can come into tremendous bondage over conscience. And the second one is just our wills. Just our independent, selfish wills. And many of us can come into bondage over our wills. And the third one is just the psychological part of us, our mind and emotions. And many of us can come into bondage about our mind and emotions. And then the fourth one really refers to the inner part of us, our spirits. And many of us can come into bondage in regard to our spirits. Now, brothers and sisters, there is a truth that is in Jesus that delivers us from bondage in each area of our lives. It it corresponds really, in a way, you know, to the birth of Jesus and to the death of Jesus and to the resurrection of Jesus and to the ascension of Jesus. And really it is God's will that we would experience the birth and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus completely in regard to each of those areas of our lives. And if we don't, we come into bondage. Now, loved ones, there is only one way really to experience the birth and death and resurrection and the ascension of Jesus in reality in our own lives, and that is through faith. And faith is very simple. It consists of believing and obeying. And each time in regard to this area of our lives, all we really have to do is to believe certain things about Jesus and to obey certain things in Jesus. And we come into freedom. Now, let's just take the first one, you know, the old business of conscience. Most of us start our Christian lives by coming into a real sense of bondage over a verse like Matthew 5 and 22. And you could look at it if, if you want, though some of you will know it just by the, the chapter that it's in. Matthew 5 and verse 22. 
We read a verse like this and we immediately come into a tremendous bondage. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool shall be liable to the hell of fire. And many of us come into just great bondage in our consciences when we begin to realize that we are doing things that God has told us deserve the penalty of eternal death and separation from him. And we just come into a great bondage of guilt. We know that the wages of sin is death and we know that we have sin in our own lives. Now really, brothers and sisters, the way out of that bondage is very clearly stated in the Bible. And it refers really to the whole business of the new birth in the Spirit. We are asked to believe a certain thing about Jesus. And that certain thing is in Romans 4 and 24. And you can look at it at Romans 4 and 24. And it's stated there plainly by God, It will be reckoned to us who believe in him that raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was put to death for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And it's stated plainly there that if you believe that Jesus has died for that sin in your life, then that faith of yours will be reckoned to right as righteousness. And you're asked to believe. And the second thing you're asked to do is stated in Matthew 30, Matthew 3 and verse 2. And you remember it's that plain statement of Jesus that you have to believe, and then in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And dear ones, that's all we're called to do, to be free from the bondage of guilt. But many of us mess the whole thing up. We begin to realize, now we have to repent. And we begin to come under bondage about repentance. We have an incredible ability to turn God's freedom into salvation by works. And some of us will do that. We'll look at uh, the believing and we'll look at the obeying or the repenting and we'll say, well, the repenting, that means I have to repent thoroughly. And we get down to bringing about a thorough repentance. And many of us begin to feel, unless we feel a desperate sorrow for our sins, we have not truly repented. And I know there's a dear sister among us in these days who just feels she doesn't repent enough. And she feels, no, I don't feel repentance. I have to feel it. I have to feel it. Loved ones, do you see that repentance is just what it says? You turn from your sin. And if you keep sinning, you keep turning from your sinning. But repentance is a metanoia. It's a change of mind. You turn from what you're doing and you turn to Jesus. It is not a matter of feeling repentance. But brothers and sisters, many of us have turned from the truth that sets us free and have turned to the error of Satan. And we've begun to sense, oh, I must feel this repentance. I don't feel it enough. God can't forgive me because I don't feel it enough. Do you see where that's taking you? That's taking you into works. You're saying, if I don't do this work thoroughly enough, God cannot forgive you. Dear ones, you'll never repent deeply enough to justify God forgiving you. God forgives you because you are justified by the blood of Jesus. And it's that truth, you see, that sets you free. It's Romans 5 and 9. It isn't the thoroughness of your repentance. Certainly God asks you to repent. He says, if you repent and believe, then the blood of my Son will justify you in my eyes. But do you see... The blood of Jesus justifies you in God's eyes because you've repented and believed, not because of the thoroughness of your sorrow at your sin. And loved ones, it's very important to see it. Otherwise, you can begin to punish yourself, you see. And many of us have come into that. We've sinned and we've, done, we've committed a sin that we committed ten weeks before. And we know it's wrong. And we begin to sense inside ourselves, no, I deserve to have a period of real contrition here before God can possibly accept me into his family again. And therefore, we impose upon ourselves a certain time limit. And we say, unless we go through this period of contrition, 
really God cannot possibly forgive us. Now, loved ones, do you see that's just the doctrine of penance that brought so many dear ones in the Catholic Church into bondage? That's what penance is. It's saying, unless I punish myself enough, unless I sorrow enough, God will not forgive me. Dear ones, repentance is turning from your sin and believing that the blood of Jesus alone will make you right with God, not the thoroughness of your repentance. Nevertheless, you have to be thorough, you know. You have to go through all the sins that you have and repent of them. But you don't have to squeeze yourself dry to get yourself sorrowful enough. Many of us have come into the same problem over confession, which is part of repentance. Many of us fall into the bondage of a tea group or a sensitivity group. We feel, you see, have I confessed everything? I must confess. I must confess again. No, I didn't make that right with that other brother, so I must make it right again. And many of us come into a place where we think, oh, now have I confessed everything? Have I confessed everything? Dear ones have come to me, you know, and said, weeks and weeks after weeks, and said, I have something else to confess, something else to confess. Now, loved ones, do you see that that is bondage? You confess all that you know is wrong in your life, you make it straight before God, you make it straight with other people, you turn from it, and that's your confession and repentance. Now, many of us, you see, come into bondage even over the believing. The believing is to believe that the blood of Jesus justifies us before God. To believe simply that Jesus has died for our sins. But many of us come into the old heresy of a corner on truth. You know, we feel we believe in the substitutionary death of Jesus in a subtly different way to all other churches. And that's what saves us. And loved ones, that just brings you into bondage. It brings you into a a preoccupation with the peccadilloes of the atonement. Do you see that God expects you to believe that Jesus has died for you? Just to believe that. And it's the death of Jesus that makes you right with God. It's not your exact precise statement of the atonement or of the way Jesus' death saved you. It's simply your believing that Jesus has died for you. Brothers and sisters, there's such a freedom comes into your life when you reduce it all to simply repenting and believing. Just repenting of your sins and believing that Jesus' death satisfies your Father. Just that. And suddenly there comes into your heart just a clear assurance of God's acceptance with you. But brothers and sisters, do you see that the truth makes you free? It's the errors and lies of Satan that brings you into bondage about that. Now, just to to go on, and maybe, you know, we won't get through the four parts tonight. Maybe we'll just really get as far as the second part. But many of us, after we're born of the Spirit, come into this problem of the will that will not obey Jesus. And that's what I shared with you this morning, you know. We come into this area where we find that our wills do not want to submit to God's law. Indeed, they cannot submit. They just keep acting against God in rebellion. And we try to bend them in God's direction and we cannot do anything about them. Now, brothers and sisters, God has made provision for that too. You see. It is madness for us to come into that hypocritical double life and almost go insane thinking that God has not made provision for it. Loved ones, God has made clear provision for it. And again here, The truth makes you free. The truth really is very simple. You know, it's stated in the Bible. Just as Romans 5 and 9 is the truth that sets you free there, the truth that sets you free there is Romans 6 and 6, that our old self was crucified with Christ. And God has said that that is made real in our lives just as that is made real in our lives if again we believe and obey. This time we believe Romans 6 and 11. You reckon you remember that you have been crucified with Christ. And you submit, in Romans 6 and 13, you submit your members to the Spirit of God. But again, it's belief and obey. And really, it's very simple. But many of us break away from the freedom that is in those words. And we come into bondage. We find this old will that we can do nothing about, and we start to rationalize it. 
And we say, well, I mean, masturbation isn't too bad. It's kind of a, a human trait that many of us have to face through the early part of our lives, and marriage will clear it all up. Or, you know, if we criticize people a bit, we say, well, you need to use the old critical faculty. Otherwise, where would you be? You have to judge people to know who to agree with and who not to agree with. <coughs> or we rationalize the not getting up in the morning. We say, well, we just happen to be people who lie late and we work better late at night than we do early in the morning. And no doubt we'll be able to work into deep prayer later on in the evenings. Or we say to ourselves, well, witnessing, yeah, but I'm just a different kind of person. I'm not one of these people who can run up with the four spiritual laws and witness like that. I have to go more slowly and subtly about it. I believe in friendship evangelism. And you know, we believe in friendship evangelism, but it never gets to evangelism. It just gets to friendship. But many of us, loved ones, forget the truth that is in these verses, and instead we set about delivering ourselves from this problem here again by works, you see. We fall into a salvation by works. And the only way we can get rid of it is to rationalize the failings of this will. And many brothers and sisters walk in bondage to that will because they keep on rationalizing and rationalizing. Or many of us just repress it. We just keep repressing it. The old anger is coming up inside us and we just repress it. We just press it down. And we try to love people on the outside despite the anger. Or the irritability comes up and we try to just repress it. And we keep repressing these things and repressing them. Now, loved ones, do you see that the truth sets you free? The truth doesn't bring you into bondage like that. It is not God's will that you should walk in continual repression that shows like that grey defeat in the back of your eyes. It is God's will that you should walk free of this. Not in rationalizing and not in repression, but just in a real deliverance. Some of us, you know, feel, oh, well, yeah, yeah, I believe that, but I have to see it for myself. And we start introspecting. And we start looking inside. And we get all worked up with looking inside and working out our motives and our attitudes and our reactions and our desires. And again, we come into a tremendous bondage. And brothers and sisters, you know that many of us who have come into an awareness of the problem of our selfish, independent will have not walked the way of freedom at all. We have walked rather the way of bondage. We have walked either in continual introspection or in continual repression or in continual rationalizing. Many of us, for instance, just disagree with God. We come into a total despair. Now, loved ones, do you see that a total despair is a blank rejection of what God has said is true about us in the Bible? Now, if you look at it, you'll see it there. It's Romans 7 and 18. Romans 7 and 18. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. For I know that nothing good dwells within me. Now, coming into despair is a rejection of that truth. Do you see that you come into despair because you're still hoping for something good from inside you? There's a great peace comes inside in your heart when you accept, that's right, there is nothing good inside me. And God sees that clearly, and he ac ac expects me to accept that. But we come into bondage of despair when we're still hoping for something good inside us. Or the other reason we come into despair is because we don't really believe Romans 5 and 9. Romans 5 and 9 says, you're justified by the blood of Jesus. We come into despair because deep down we really believe we're going to be justified by our victorious life. Or by our good works. Or our, by our victory over sin. And that's why we come into this despair. But again, do you see, it's the lie of Satan that brings us into bondage. The truth that is in the Son sets us free. And the truth that is in the Son is, there is no good in you at all. And the reason you're having such trouble with yourself is, you're still expecting some good from inside you. Actually, what God wants you to see is that there is no good in you. And in fact, to believe, to reckon yourself dead indeed with Jesus on the cross. 
And the word reckon in Greek means to treat yourself as really dead. But many of us, you see, keep on rationalizing and repressing. But when we come into a situation where somebody attacks us or criticizes us in the office, we don't act as a corpse. No, we're very much alive. We whip right back. The old corpse is lying flat on the ground. Suddenly the arm lifts up and strikes the fellow back. Now, do you see that that's where we're going astray? We're rationalizing, we're repressing, we're introspecting, we're coming into despair, but we're not reckoning ourselves dead indeed unto Jesus. Dead indeed unto self and alive to Jesus. Now do you see that believing is an active thing? Loved ones, a number of us are coming into bondage here because we're thinking this is a game that you play in your thoughts. It isn't. Believing is a very active thing. Be lefile in Anglo-Saxon means you be in accordance with what the truth is. The truth is you were crucified with Christ, so okay, let him tear you apart. What's he tearing apart? An old dead corpse? What does that matter? But do you see, you be in accordance with what is the truth in Jesus. Belief is not a juggling with thoughts, loved ones. It's not introspection, it's not repression, it's not rationalization, it's not despair. It's simply acting as if you're being <coughs> crucified with Christ and there's no you to respond. And then obedience is the same thing. You see, a lot of us are coming into this place where we say, well, well, I, I believe that I'm crucified with Christ, but uh, I still don't feel crucified. It doesn't matter whether you feel it or not. It doesn't matter whether other people see it or not. You believe that you've been crucified with Christ and you submit yourself to the Holy Spirit at each moment as he tells you things. But brothers and sisters, do you see that truth is in a way a very external thing? And I think a number of us, you see, come into bondage because we make it an internal juggling with thought life. No, it isn't. It's a believing that you've been crucified with Christ and an acting as if that's true and it's a submitting to the Holy Spirit the first time he tells you to do something. But both of those are very external things. In fact, faith in the New Testament is a very external thing. It's a believing, a treating yourself as if this is true and as if this is true and it's an obeying, an obeying God when he tells you to repent and obeying his Spirit when he tells you to do things. And loved ones, that those truths set you free. And you know, I'm sure a number of you are sitting there and saying, oh, but how does it all become real? That's up to the Holy Spirit. It's up to the Holy Spirit to make the truth of these two facts real in you. It's not up to you to look in and see, is my crucifixion with Christ real? Is my new birth real? It's up to the Holy Spirit to make those things real in you as you take care of these things that you can take care of. But brothers and sisters, really, that is the way of freedom, you know. And the truth will always set you free. It will never bring you into bondage. When you find a brother or sister, you know, coming into bondage over their crucifixion with Christ, it's not because they're coming into the truth. It's because they're coming into one of these subtle lies or errors of Satan. But the truth itself will always set you free. Now, loved ones, do you see, tonight, really, all I can do is present those truths briefly to you and give you the scripture verses. You yourself need to go to the Holy Spirit and ask him, Holy Spirit, am I coming into bondage to some deception of Satan in these areas of my life? Is it because I've accepted some of Satan's lies that I'm in bondage about my forgiveness of my sins, or about my victory over sin? Am I really dwelling in the truth? And loved ones, the truth is really a joyful thing to live in, you see. And the truth is, those two things there, actually entering into those in actuality. And that, that sets you free, it really does. Next uh, Sunday evening, you know, I'd like to do a little about these areas here that we've talked of before at times the mind and emotions and how they're connected really with the resurrection of Jesus and the spirit and how it's connected with the ascension of Jesus. And some of you, you know, may find that you've come as far as to and you are having victory there. And yet you're coming into bondage here in these areas. 
But loved ones, do you see that it's really a very simple thing? It really is. And we should see it as that. And it's an active thing, you see. It's not a feeling thing. It's not an internal juggling of thoughts thing. It's an act of believing and obeying. So will you just, you know, go to the Holy Spirit and, and ask him, Holy Spirit, have I come into unnecessary bondage in these areas? And really get clear and walk free, you know. Walk free each day. It is the Father's will. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that your way is a way of freedom. Savior, we know that Satan is in among us, trying to internalize this whole business until it's all a psychological game. But Lord Jesus, we know it's a very sure appropriation of what has happened to us in you on Calvary. And Lord Jesus, we know that it is the Holy Spirit that makes these things real in us. It isn't us by all our emotions and all our introspection. It is the Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that if we do our part, you will do yours. And we thank you that our part is so clear and so obvious. In order to come into a real forgiveness of our sins and a real freedom from guilt in our consciences, we have simply to repent, turn from our sins, and to believe that you have died for us. And in regard to that old, selfish, independent will inside us that is making a mess of our Christian lives, we have simply to accept that we were crucified with you and to live as if that is really true by submitting to your Holy Spirit each time he speaks. Lord Jesus, we thank you that it is such a joyous way. We thank you that it is such a way of freedom and liberty. Now I trust you, Savior, by your Holy Spirit to apply this to each brother and sister here tonight so that if there is anyone here walking in bondage in regard to their conscience or their wills, they will come into real freedom in you. Lord, we thank you that you have told us that we are to rejoice. And again, you said to us to rejoice. And we thank you that we can walk in continual joy because all of this has been done already in you. And we have simply to accept it into our own lives. We commit ourselves to you for this purpose. Now, Lord Jesus, in the coming week, we trust you to find it easy to live freely in us. Lord Jesus, we commit ourselves to living for you, to putting you first. We commit ourselves to turning from our own selves and all our self-concern, wondering what people are thinking of us, wondering how we're doing. And we commit ourselves to looking to you and being concerned about you this week, not us. Saviour, we trust you to give us a Christ-centered life as we do this so that you will, in every way, be able to live your life again through us wherever we go these next six days. Now we commit ourselves to you. Trust you to fill us with your Spirit for this purpose. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore. Amen.